your Bibles now if you have them or if you have access to a copy of the scriptures, would you join me uh, once again in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, and as, as we've seen, it's one of the longest books of the Bible, so if you flip around in the Old Testament long enough, you're going to run into Jeremiah. So I'm going to ask you to join me in Jeremiah chapter 13. We are letting uh, this prophet lead us through Lent and towards Easter. Uh, we're seeing how his bad news leads us to the good news uh, of Jesus, and we'll see that once again uh, this week. Jeremiah chapter 13. I'll begin reading in verse 1 and read through verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to me, Go and buy a linen loincloth and put it around your waist, and do not dip it in water. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise. Go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a cleft of the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And after many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they would not listen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Father, I pray that this morning that last sentence would not be true of us. I pray that this morning that we would be a people who listen. That even when your word says difficult and strange things to us, that we would trust that it is good, that it is life-giving, and that we would come and we would listen deeply to what you have to say. Would you open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, so that we can receive your message and be changed by it this morning. And we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in the season of award shows. The Grammys was a few weeks ago, the Oscars are next week, and of course these events aren't just about movies and music, they are about fashion. What are the stars wearing as they walk on the red carpet? Only it's interesting that when those celebrities are asked about their outfits, they are not asked, what are you wearing? They are asked, who are you wearing? And that question reminds me of our text for this morning. Prophets like Jeremiah didn't just talk. They were like performance artists. Their bodies and their behaviors were vehicles for God to communicate his message to his people. And so as Jeremiah bought war and then ruined this piece of clothing, God was communicating about himself and his relationship to his people and to us. And the underlying message is this. When God is asked, who are you wearing? He wants the answer to be us. God wants to wear us. Not as those who design his clothes, but as those who are his clothes. Now that is a strange thing to say. 
which is unsurprising for the book of Jeremiah. That is a strange message to hear that God wants to wear us. And so I want us to take a few moments this morning and consider that image, consider that message together. And we'll ask two questions. First of all, why does God want to wear us? And secondly, how can God wear us? First of all, why does God want to wear us? And verse 11 spells out two reasons that God wants to wear his people. And the first reason is intimacy. He says in verse 11 that he made his people so that they would cling to him. Now, PhD candidates have to have something to write their dissertations about. And so there are all sorts of debates about exactly what kind of garment is this that Jeremiah purchases and wears? Are we talking here about Jeremiah's underwear? Well, one thing that is clear about this garment is that it would have come into contact with skin in a bathing suit area of the, of the body. <laughs> And God says, I want to be that close. That is how close, how near to my people I want to be. And this is an image of the covenant. This is an image of the relationship that God had established with his people when he said, I will be my God and you will be my people. One other thing we know about Jeremiah's garment is that it was made of linen, which was the fabric designated by God for the uniform of Jeremiah's other job. Jeremiah wasn't only a prophet, he wasn't only a performance artist, he was also a priest. And the priests wore linen as their uniform, and their job was to help the people live in this covenant relationship with God. And they did that with the liturgy and the sacrifices, helping the people draw near to the one who had drawn near to them. Helping God's people to come close to his presence, to love and to be loved by him. And so for God to wear his people means that he desires to be profoundly near to them. But this profound intimacy was not intended by God to remain private. I hate to disappoint your inner middle schooler, but we are not exactly talking about underwear in the way that we think of underwear. This garment, one of the things we know about this garment that Jeremiah wore was that it was meant to be seen. The priests, the garments they wore were designed to be beautiful, to display the beauty of God and display the beauty of dwelling in his presence. And so this was a garment that was meant to be seen. And so verse 11 gives us another reason for God to wear his people. And it is not only that they would cling to him, but that they would be for him a name, a praise, and a glory. That not, they would not only be close to him, not only that they would be near to him, but that they would display his splendor. The purpose of wearing his people is not only intimacy, it is glory and it is beauty. It is to show the world how good and beautiful he is. This point is made by another passage, a more well-known passage in the book of Jeremiah, when in chapter 18, Jeremiah goes to the workshop of the potter. And as he watches the work of that artisan, he shows us the work of the, design, of the divine artisan, who by coming into contact with the clay of his people, wants to shape of them something useful and beautiful. But that message not only sounds at multiple points in Jeremiah, that message also sounds at the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, which tells us that God formed humanity like a potter from the dust of the ground to be in his likeness and his image. 
likeness in the sense of divine, of, of familial relatedness, parent and child, intimacy, image in the sense of public rep- representation and reputation, intimacy and beauty. But that message not only sounded in Jeremiah and in Genesis, that message also sounded in Jesus as he described the new covenant relationship that is possible through him. And so for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells those of us who belong to him that we have a father in heaven who is so close, whose affection and attention is so near to us that he knows the number of our the hairs on our heads, but who also calls us to be the light of the world, a city on a hill so that others will see our good works and will hear the echo of Jeremiah, glorify our Father who is in heaven. Do you hear it? Intimacy, glory, nearness, beauty. That's why God wants to wear us. That is why he wants to wear you. He desires to be in such a close communion with you that you become a revelation of what he is like, of what he wants, his beauty and his glory. That's why you breathe. That's why your heart beats in order to be garment of God. Don't settle for a lesser purpose. Don't settle for anything less than that. I heard heard someone say recently that our modern conception of what it means to be human is that we are merely pleasure sacks made of stardust, bags of appetites, made of random material. No, you are more than that. You were made, you were meant for more than that. You were made to be the beautiful garment of God. I saw a scene recently from One of the old Superman movies from the late 70s and early 80s, Christopher Reeve played Superman, which of course meant he also played Superman's awkward, bashful alter ego, Clark Kent. And usually the shift from Clark Kent to Superman is marked by a change in costume, from a drab, boring suit to the bright blue and red of his tights and his cape. But in this scene that I saw, the shift from Clark Kent to Superman was simpler. It was different. It was made merely by him taking off his glasses. So he's talking to Lois Lane, and Lois Lane says something nice about him. She walks out of the room. He takes off his glasses, and as he takes off his glasses, his shoulders are held back. His posture becomes erect. His chest expands, and all of a sudden, even in his suit, Clark Kent is Superman. That's what I would love to happen to you as you walk out these doors this morning. That you would hear the message that God wants to wear you. And your posture would become a little more erect. Your shoulders held back. You could walk out of here with the profound sense of what God has made you for. But maybe that's not what happens when you hear that message. Maybe when you hear the message that you are supposed to live close to God as a reflection of him, maybe your shoulders go in the opposite direction. Maybe your shoulders sag a little bit more because when you hear that message, you hear the word failure. And all you can think of are the ways that you haven't done that. All the ways that you haven't been that. 
And that would make sense with this passage because this passage is about the failure of God's people to be the garment that they were supposed to be. And so it raises a second question. How? If God wants to wear us in this way, how is that possible? And to answer that question, we have to identify the problem and identify the solution. So first of all, what's the problem? Why have the people fail to be the garment that they are supposed to be. And unsurprisingly, from what we've heard from Jeremiah over the past several weeks, the problem is sin. And what is sin? Verse 10, I think, is a great description, a great summary of what sin is. The people had not listened to the voice of God. They had followed their own hearts, and they had worshiped. They had gone after other gods. So sin is refusing what God wants, elevating what we want, and then replacing God with someone or something else as our highest, as our ultimate. But the focus of this passage isn't on the definition of sin, it is on the result of sin. And we see two results of sin here. First, God tells Jeremiah to go with his new nice outfit on a trip. He sends him on a trip where? To the river Euphrates. What the Nile was to Egypt, the Euphrates was to the Babylonian empire. And so Jeremiah is enacting the tragic journey that God's people will go on as a result of their sin. They will be taken away from Jerusalem, the place of nearness to God and sent into exile. Why? Because sin creates distance instead of closeness and intimacy with God. Second result of sin, what does God tell Jeremiah to do at the Euphrates River? Well, he's to take his nice new outfit and put it in the rocks, bury it in some rocks in order to ruin it, right? So he comes back and he finds that it is completely useless. It has been rotted and ruined. And he does that in order to show the second result of sin, which is that sin mars our ability to live for the beauty, to display the glory of God, to do what we were made for. And the performance ends there in Jeremiah 13. Jeremiah enacts the problem and then drop the curtain, performance over. And so is there a solution? What is the solution to the problem of sin which creates distance and makes it impossible for us to live as the beauty of God? Well, though the scene ends here in Jeremiah 13, the movie does not. Jeremiah keeps writing, and in chapter 18, when he goes to the potter's workshop, he does see the potter ruin a marred vessel, but then he begins to reshape that vessel. And then Jeremiah, he keeps writing. And if you'll remember those three words, that triplet of words in verse 11, name, praise, and glory, they are used one other place in Jeremiah's book. And it's in chapter 33, as Jeremiah begins to talk about what will happen after and as a result of the judgment that God was bringing on his people. And he begins to talk about hope. He begins to talk about newness. And he says, through this judgment and after this judgment, God will begin to remake a people who will be for him a name, a praise, and a glory. And so it's interesting that the Euphrates River wasn't only a river in Babylon. It was also a river in Eden. It was one of the waters that flowed from the garden where this ideal of humanity as the image and likeness of God existed. So Jeremiah is saying that God will take the waters of judgment, the Euphrates of Babylon, and he will make them the waters of cleansing 
the renewal of Eden, that he will through this process of judgment, not in the end abandon his people and abandon his intention for humanity, but he will wash and reweave a garment of beauty for himself. And the solution that Jeremiah anticipated, Jesus accomplished. Jesus, who is the Son of God and who Colossians 1 calls the perfect image of the invisible God. Jesus, who on the cross was drowned in the waters of judgment so that he could become for us the waters of cleansing and renewal. Not the Euphrates of Babylon, but the Euphrates of Eden. Jesus, who was stripped in the shame of our sin so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. That's how God wears us. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? After his resurrection and as he was ascending to heaven, what did he say to them? This is in Luke chapter 24. He said, I want you to go where? To Jerusalem, to the place of nearness to God, and I want you to wait. Wait for what? To be clothed with power. That's how he describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is the coming of God's nearness that will make a people who are a name, a praise, a glory, a demonstration of the goodness and the beauty of God for the world. That's how God wears us. God wears us by clothing us with his son and spirit. And that's why the New Testament is full of fashion language. Put off, put on which is the Greek language for a change of outfit. And that language is all over the New Testament. It is in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st Peter, Hebrews, and James. Do you think it's important? One example, the book of Colossians. Colossians 1 says, as I've already said, Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. Colossians 3 says that because of that and by faith in that, we can put off the old man with its passions, greed, sexual immorality, anger, and we can put on the new man. We can put on a new humanity that is being renewed in the image of the creator in kindness, compassion, and love. That's how God wears you by giving you the gift of wrapping you in his Holy Spirit, of clothing you in the righteousness of his son. And so you can go out the, the doors this morning, not only with the purpose of being the garment of God, but with the possibility of being the garment of God as you receive that gift by faith. There is a brief aside early on in Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov. And it seems like it's a digression, but it does become important for the story. But the narrator is describing the neighbors that live around the Karamazov home. And he describes one particular dilapidated house where lives an old woman and her daughter. And this older woman had in her earlier years served in very wealthy and prominent homes. And as a result of her role, she had been given by these families beautiful dresses with long trains. But as she aged, she was unable to fulfill that role. And so she was cast off, cruelly fired by these families. And she descended with her daughter into poverty so that she had to go to her neighbor's houses and beg for soup and bread. But as she would go to these neighbor's houses begging for soup and bread, she would put on those fancy dresses with those long trains, clinging to a sense of dignity in the midst of her humiliation. The gospel allows us to live in a way that is even better than that. When we hear that word failure, 
when we feel the shame of all of the ways that we have not lived, that we have not been the beautiful garment of God, we can take up the fancy dress of the gospel. And we can clothe ourselves by faith with the perfect righteousness of Jesus, with the power of his Holy Spirit, And we can live in the assurance that God is washing and he is reweaving our lives. And one day we will stand before the throne of heaven in garments of white what? What's the fabric described in the book of Revelation? White linen. In the garments of the priests of God displaying his beauty and his goodness. Will you let God wear you by clothing you with his son and spirit this week? So we don't have any red carpet this morning. But I do want to ask you, Who are you wearing? Let's pray. Father, what a gift that you have given to us. You have not left us in the shame of our sin. You have not left us cast off, buried and rotting by the Euphrates River. But by your grace through your son, you have given a way for us to be washed to be cleansed, and to be clothed. Would you help us to embrace this incredible purpose that you give to our lives? Would you also help us to embrace the power that you have given to us in order to live that purpose through what Jesus has done in the presence of your spirit? Father, help us to know and enjoy the truth that we are clothed with a righteousness not our own and that we are being made beautiful garments for your glory. And we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.